Last season, I managed to finish 13th on the NFL Power Ranking. Will I do better next season? We'll find out in this video. Also, Mel Kuyper thinks we're going to draft a defensive end in the first round. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper, in a way? Quickly, before we go on to the offseason, I wanted to show off some interesting things like who won their trades from last season. Sean Springs had a pretty darn good season with his new team, Pittsburgh, while Aaron Smith had himself a lackluster season. Stats don't tell the whole story, maybe most of those tackles were run stuffs. Pat Williams had a pretty decent season considering the position he plays and is one of the three trades the Bengals made during the season to help their defense. They traded Rudy Johnson for him. I I definitely think it was worth it as Johnson had a down year compared to the previous season. The Bengals also traded for Burt Berry who had a very good season. They really beefed up their defense this year. Daryl Gardner was the player that was traded. He had a decent season but injury prevented him from playing 5 games. Player awards were another thing I wanted to show you guys. Dante Culpepper won MVP. He's clearly very good and no one should be blamed if he were to be signed over you know another player. Grass is always greener on the other side guys. Offensive Player of the Year, Air McNair. I would argue that McNair had a better season than Culpepper, but I guess Culpepper is just that much more important to his team. Defensive Player of the Year is Tony Parrish. The dude had an incredible season. The past three seasons alone for him have been outstanding. He could have been MVP in my mind too. Offensive Rookie of the Year, Ben Roethlisberger. Remember when this guy was skinny? You know, before being a fat piece of shit. Defensive Rookie of the Year is Teddy Lamon. If you're a Detroit fan, you know this guy, and if you know him, you, you know he didn't do much after his first season. The rushing title went to Clinton Portis. This was his first season with Washington after their trade with Denver for Champ Bailey. Lastly, the Super Bowl MVP was Priest Holmes, the man who had an absurd three-year stretch. In this alternate reality, he deserved a ring. Well, as, as a starter. Now what we've all been waiting for, there's only one player who is deciding to hang up his jersey. Terrence Wilkins. This past season was his best in the past three years. His average catch was 19.6. Even though he wasn't used much, he made the best of it when he did get it. I did consider giving him an offer, but at the end of the day, I chose not to bring him back, and I'm sure he's happy to finish on a, on a high note. The wide receiver room is packed already as it is, and considering he's the lowest rated wide receiver we have, it's amazing he got any playing time. Tolver didn't see the field at all. Snoop didn't play much, so I decided to let Wilkins retire with the hopes that we have enough depth going into the season. Of course, Wilkins isn't the only retirement in the league. I'm going to go over some of them quickly. Shannon Sharp retired with the Chicago Bears. He retired before the 2004 season in real life. Garrison Hurst, the first ever Madden cover athlete, had a better final season in 2K5. Keenan McCardell was something to watch, but after 14 years in the league, he's done. His teammate Joey Galloway decides to follow him into retirement. Hey, at least they're already in Florida. We don't like to talk about Emmett Smith's tenure in Arizona other than the fact that it happened, but now he can finally retire. Lassiter also retired this season with the Chargers. He passed away in 2019. Morden Anderson retired after getting a Super Bowl ring with the Chiefs. This man actually played for two more seasons. Now before Minnesota fans get angry, no, he's not Gary Anderson. This Anderson is the one who actually made the kick. Vinny Testaverde retires after a 19 year career. What's more shocking is he played three more seasons in real life. Mike Mentor was with the Carolina Panthers, but after nine seasons, he will be retiring at the peak of his career. Mushin Mohammed also retiring. Still very good, but I guess he'd rather retire than, than get more banged up down the road. Ricky Prohl is also retiring. 16 years is a long time. He's a good supporting player, and the Panthers team is going to look very different next year. Terrell Buckley will be retiring with the Patriots along with Willie McGinnis, which is good for our Dolphins because this guy was wrecking havoc. Tim Brown is retiring and interesting enough he's doing it as a Raider. He actually retired. The last team he actually played with was Tampa Bay. Jerry Rice is somehow still playing. I will never retire! 
and will be heading into his 22nd season. One of the last big names of the retirement is Victor Green. In his prime, he was a ball hawk. He's no longer in his prime, and he's retiring. And I almost forgot about this guy, Michael Barrow. 13 years in the league, and he's calling it a quit on a high note. Now we have to sign our guys. With only 8.34 million in cap space, this is gonna be difficult. And we still have to sign our draft picks. Chris Chambers is the future of this franchise, and I made up my mind we gonna resign him. I went ahead, gave him a four-year deal, with half of that being guaranteed, because I don't see us moving on from him. The Bratsky was very serviceable as a gap player, but he's too old and mainly too expensive for us this season, so I'm gonna let him walk. I did want to see how much he wanted, and well, it's a lot. Sammy Knight, good night is a pretty good player and i think he's past his prime plus i have to be very careful with what i use my money on i also looked into an offer with knight but i just felt like he was asking a bit too much and I'm gonna be cheap this year. We have no running backs on contract behind Ricky Williams. Travis Miner, I hardly know her, is a decent depth player, but I felt like he wanted a little too much. Leonard Henry is the other back, and to be honest, I have no emotional investment in him, so I'm gonna let him go. Also, on a side note, I gave Booker his number back since Wilkins retired. Ed Perry had three catches in four seasons. I'm not gonna bring him back. Seth McKenney was our starting center last season. We don't have good depth behind him, so I considered resigning him. I just felt like he was too expensive for how good he was, so I will be letting him walk. John St. Clair would free up 1.24 million if we were to get rid of him. I figured we could trade him for a young cheap running back. It clears up cap space and gives us depth behind Ricky Williams. We ended up gaining some cap without losing much depth at tackle. While like I said earlier with no one behind Ricky Williams under contract, Michael Turner gives us help in that area. Yeah, his rating isn't great and I'm sure we could have gotten more out of the trade, but this is about realism not abusing the AI. The Chargers got a decent tackle, potentially a starter with a high cap hit that they can afford, and in return we get a project player with a better position in the fourth round of the draft. His ratings don't jump out at you, but he's serviceable and if the Chargers want, they can cut him with no penalty. Now you're probably wondering why am I showing you David Bowens? He didn't start last season, I considered trading him, but let's be honest, no team needs a defensive end, especially one rated this slow, so I just cut him. Moreland Greenwood had a really good season last year. He ended up with four sacks, 89 tackles. He earned himself that second contract. It was only a two-year deal, but he accepted it. Sean Wooden played all 16 games last year. He wasn't the starter. He played situational. With that being said, he's not coming back. Another cap casualty would be Darius Thompson. Although instead of being cut, I traded him along with Romero and a fifth round pick for Jake Grove and a sixth round pick. This means we don't have to re-sign McKinney and he's really cheap as well. He's a young player that's only going to get better, hopefully. Plus, it gives us time to develop someone else behind him for two years. Thompson, on the other hand, becomes the third receivers on the Raiders to help with the recently retired Tim Brown. You're probably wondering why I added Romero. Well, the Raiders actually wanted him. Maybe they see him as someone they can develop behind two outstanding players. Here are the players that will be let go and will hit the open market that is free agency. The free agents this year don't seem too exciting. It's headlined by Ferguson, Franks, and Andrezzi. I did find Lamar Smith, who I considered signing, but only because he gave Miami their only playoff win in the past 20 years. In the end, I didn't sign anyone and basically skipped this year's free agency. Didn't really have much money to sign anyone to begin with. The Combine is next. I'm not gonna lie, I feel like the Combine is unnecessary, so I skipped it. The NFL Draft is actually really quick in this game. Our first round pick is Randall Herrera, an offensive tackle who's great at run blocking but will need time to learn how to pass block in the NFL. Our second round pick, I selected Steven Sandoval. As you can tell, I'm trying to beef up that offensive line. Sandoval looks like a day one starter. 
In the third round, I selected Bradley Sparks. I don't plan on Sparksing the field a lot this season. I want him to develop more. Our second third round pick is Tommy Johnston. This may be our first real bust in the draft based on ratings, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. The first fourth round pick I selected, Irvin Lindsay. This right here is what's called a steal. For a fourth round pick, that's pretty good. Our second fourth round pick was Raphael Allison. He could be considered a bust, but speed kills. We didn't have a fifth round pick, but our first sixth round pick was Kent Curry. We don't have good depth behind Jake Grove, and I believe having this guy sit behind him for two seasons could be very good for his development. With the second sixth round pick, I selected Neil Lamb. For how late we got these six round picks, I think their ratings are pretty good, decent depth at the very least. And with the final pick for the Miami Dolphins, I selected Carl Hudson. In the seventh round, his ratings are very low, but seventh round pick you shouldn't really have high expectations i won't be going over the rookie contracts but when i go over the whole roster you'll be able to get a chance to look at them i just feel like they're not super important right now that being said the rookies did make us go over the cap so that means we need to clear out almost two million in cap space before the regular season William Delahassey is looking like a cap casualty with the new rookie Kent Curry taking over the backup role. His release clears up a quarter of a million. Look at that overstacked guard position. Just like Delahassey, Greg German becomes a cap casualty because of the rookie Sandoval. His release also clears up another quarter of a million. The outside linebacking position is another crowded group. Corey Jenkins sees himself on the way out as another rookie takes his spot. Neil Lamb forces Jenkins out as another cap casualty that saves us almost 4,000. Fact. When both the Detroit Lions and the Cleveland Browns went winless in their respected seasons, both teams went 4-0 in the preseason. Now, I didn't say it was a fun fact. I bet you're thinking, oh, I didn't know you can still play games over the cap. No, nah, you can't. <laughs> well, not the regular season anyways. It forced me into the preseason and simulated on its own. Vernon Carey got injured and I was going to trade him to get under the cap. You can't release injured players and you also can't trade injured players, which means I'm now in a pickle and that, that's not kosher. Snoop is now in the hot seat. I think for the production that he gives, we can live without him. We're going to continue on with only four receivers on the roster, and Will Pull is another casualty because of the Vernon injury. Four games last season isn't worth his salary. We are now 32k under the cap, boys. Now let's go over the top players on the team just like we did last video. Ricky Williams leads the pack this time, which is interesting because he was the last one last year, and he didn't improve at all. His talents are going to be wasted here, isn't it? Jason Taylor dropped off from last season. He dropped three points, but he's still very good pass rusher, and hopefully he can continue his 10 sack season run. David Boston lost a point, but that's understandable as he didn't perform great. But maybe this season will be different for him with Booker. Second season with Kitna at starter. He actually improved over last season. Feely regressed a bit and Fielder is on a steep decline. Look at the cap penalty on Fielder. It's insane. It's cheaper to keep him than to get rid of him. Ricky Williams hasn't declined, which is good for us, but we really don't know how many years he has left in that body. Michael Turner will be replacing Travis Miner as the backup. We will be running with just two backs. Rob Conrad is as steady as a rock. Rating wise, Sammy Morris backup declining uh, the wide receiver group is looking pretty thin the good news is three of the four receivers are really good chambers booker both improved by one point last season boston of course declined ever so slightly and tover on the other hand He's developing. Randy McMichael is on a contract year. Declined slightly from last year, but maybe he can improve this season. Lee will be his backup. The center position is completely revamped. Uh, both McKinney and Delahassey are gone, replacing them. Jake Grove, who improved since the trade, and Curry, who has improved five points since being drafted. Vernon Carey is injured, so we don't know how much he developed since last season. Jano James improved by a point, which is good because he'll be one of the starters. The other, Sandoval, who also improved since being drafted in the second round. He'll be the first starter in this draft class. Both Brown and Smith improved 
and will be starting the season. There's a lot of money tied up at the tackle position. So hopefully next year Herrera, the first round pick, can develop enough to make it easier to move on if we have to in order to make space. Both Bowens and Chester regressed. Not enough to make me consider putting Sparks, the third round pick, as a starter, but we'll more than likely move on from Chester at the end of the year. Last year we had Taylor and Ungun Laie to start the season. Then we had the Bratsky. This year, we have a regressed Taylor and a really regressed Williams, plus a rookie who may or may not be a bust. <laughs> Beer us a pass rush. Seau, after his career season, regressed hard. He'll still be the starter along with Greenwood, but this is a this is becoming a position of worry. To be honest, most of the positions on defense are positions of worry. Now, the biggest shock: Zach Thomas regressed that much. We don't have great depth behind him either. Our cornerback group regressed so hard that our rookie cornerback Allison may actually get some playing time this year. Both Madison and Howard regressed by 7 points each, and what's worse, they're still the starters. One of the bright spots from our draft, Irvin Lindsay, who will be the second rookie starting on the team. He was a steal in the fourth round and he's making us look good after letting Sammy Knight go. Believe it or not, I was banking on Edwards improving, but the entire defense has just fallen back. Arturo Freeman has slightly regressed. Since he's on the final year of his contract, he's probably not coming back. Olinda Mare hasn't regressed, which is good for us. Almost everyone regressed. Matt Turk, at least we have a consistent group of people. Uh, place your bets right now, folks. Dave Wanstead, will he break 100 career wins or will he break 100 career losses first? You know the drill. Losing record after five weeks means we gotta make some roster moves. Unfortunately, after winning the season opener, they lost four straight. At this point, do we just try to go 1-15, get a good draft pick? We do have a lot of injuries, some not too serious. Thomas will be back and Bowens can still play. James does put a hamper on some things, but thankfully we got Vernon Carey back from injury, right? The guy I was gonna cut and trade earlier? <laughs> Let's see how well we're playing so far. John Kitna is performing better than he did last season at this point. Four touchdowns, two interceptions, not bad. The offensive line is still a weak point. How can you tell? Look at the yards per carry. They're not opening up lanes for our backs. William is doing the best he can with what he got. I don't know what it is with Boston and slow starts, but they seem to be connected with one another. A nice surprise is McMichael showing his skills. He's on a contract year, remember, and of course, Marty Booker and Chambers lead the group. I should have known this was to be expected, but I didn't think we would have this much of a hard time generating sacks. Without another defensive end, Jason Taylor leads the team with three. Yes, three. That's not a lot. We're forcing turnovers pretty well. Lindsay is playing outstanding for a rookie, and we got a nice surprise from Bua. Allison, the other rookie, also got an interception. We may have more interceptions than sacks on this team. Earlier this season, I tried to trade Vernon Carey away in order to create some cap space. With Geno James out for six games, you would think it would be smart to, you know, keep him. Right. I noticed that Dallas needed some guard help and had a surplus at defensive end with Vonnie Holiday. I went ahead and did a player for player trade for Holiday to help boost our pass rush. Not only is he on a cheap two year deal, he'll be a gap player to help out whoever we potentially draft next year to develop. It helps that he was a former Dolphin that I used to watch. He's clearly going to be the starter over Williams and the rookie Johnston. I also looked into boosting our cornerback group. We're struggling. I thought about trading Larry Chester. He's decent, but we do have a rookie behind him who's somewhat ready to start. Since we need help at cornerback, I shopped him around to the Giants. I was interested in Will Allen, another former Dolphin I used to watch. We could use him desperately, but his cap would be too too much for us. Ultimately, I decided against it. We didn't make too much noise before the trade deadline. If anything, we may have made our team slightly worse on the offensive line. Defensively though, I think the addition of Holiday will help. After starting out 1-4, and four, the Dolphins went 4-1 and one to get to 5-5. Five and five. Back to 500, they would drop two games. Still unable to beat the Bengals again. Then they would go on a three-game winning streak. 
but would lose the final game against the Chargers to finish the season at 8-8. Eight and eight. Once again, the Miami Dolphins find themselves just out of the playoffs. Had they beaten the Chargers, go Chargers, go! they would have made it. Had they started better than 1-4, they would have gotten in. Every game counts. There were only three trades this season, one of them being ours for Holiday. The Rams traded Timmerman for Charlie Gardner, and lastly, the Bengals traded Burt Berry, who they traded for last year away to the Panthers for Steven Davis. Now, looking at season performances, John Kitna really played well. He did a lot better than last season, and that's because last season he was pretty good. He's on a contract year, so he he's going to make us broke. Ricky Williams picked up his mid-season performance average of 3.5 to a 3.9. Clearly, our plan is to run him into the ground. Grind the bones into Michael Turner got a good amount of carries. He did not have a great average, but he's learning. This was just his second year. Booker leads the team in receiving yards. You might be wondering, how did no one break a thousand yards? We have three receivers that Kidna can spread the ball to. I have no issues with these numbers. Uh, Marty Booker has another up season with the Dolphins. I believe this trade has been nothing but great for our team. He also led the team with touchdown receptions. David Boston had a pretty darn good season considering he barely had 100 yards in the first third of the year. He needs to start fast. Chris Chambers is the pinnacle of consistency stat-wise. We know what we have out of him, which is why I didn't mind giving him that big contract. Consistency is a good thing. The biggest surprise was Randy McMichael. He almost doubled his stats from last season. We may just continue running four receivers on the roster from here on out. Zach Thomas once again led the team in tackles this year. He did miss two games, but he doubled his sack total from the year before. I think he did way better this season despite his rating dropping. Junior Seau dropped back to reality. His performance last year was insane, but he's still pretty decent this year. You remember that we couldn't get any pressure at all? Well, that all changed after the holiday. Jason Taylor got 13 and a half sacks, fourth straight season with 10 or more sacks. And Derek Pope was third on the depth chart. Derek Pope should have never seen the field. Derek Pope had six sacks last year. With even less time this season, Derek Pope had three sacks. Should I just start him? Moreland Greenwood had about as average a season you can have out of a linebacker. Not bad, not great. Vonnie Holiday, he only played five games. I'm assuming he got injured. Still managed to get five sacks. His backup, Jay Williams, played in 11 games and barely got two. This may be the most shocking thing. Sam Madison got as many interceptions on his own as the rest of the team did. This was the Madison I was hoping for last season after we traded Sertan. Defense stepped up big in the second half. Irvin Lindsay had a pretty decent season as a rookie. He didn't get rookie of the year, but he did earn rookie of my heart. Tony Bua had a good start to the season, but stalled out. Raphael Allison is another rookie who got some playing time. Two interceptions, one tackle, and a season of experience under his belt now. Olindo Mare made some long kicks this season. He missed eight, which may or may not have lost us a few games, but over Overall, pretty consistent career. Matt Turk had a down year on his average, but the man knows how to cough and kick. John Kitna will always be compared to Carson Palmer from here on out throughout their careers. Palmer had his sophomore slump. Still an okay season, but I think Kitna performed better this year. Adewale and Gunlae had a down season, just five and a half sacks. I'm calling it here, boys. We won the trades. Even when we get eight interceptions, Sertan has to get nine. Imagine if both of these guys were still on the same team. One guy I didn't look at last year was Zagania. We traded him for Orlando Brown. His numbers never really popped out, but he's still, he's very good. Both teams won their trades on that one. Just for comparison, Tim Bowens had a high tackle count and three sacks. Defensive tackle numbers don't really stand out too often either. The awards are here. The MVP is Brett Favre. He somehow got on the Cowboys. I, I don't know how. I don't know why. They, they went 9-7 and seven and missed the playoffs, so I question the legitimacy of this award. The Offensive Player of the Year was Payne Manning. He might actually be the true MVP of the year. Adam Archuleta had 
a phenomenal season, was Defensive Player of the Year. Offensive Rookie of the Year goes to Dexter Rivera. Those are rookie Manning numbers right there. Did the Cardinals find their guy? Defensive Rookie of the Year is Burnt Williamson. I'm a little bit upset that Urban Lindsay didn't get this award. The rushing title goes to Edgerin James, who just made the Hall of Fame, along with Peyton Manning. As you can see, we finished second in the division, just missing out of the playoffs again. Chargers. You just made an enemy. Last year, the 8-8 eight eight Chiefs shocked the world and won it all. Can the Bengals do the same thing? No. There was only one wildcard team that actually won their game, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Atlanta with the upset, Minnesota with the squash, and both New England and Indianapolis barely escape. Kansas City won't be able to make a repeat. I just realized the Packers didn't even make the playoffs. So now we have two classic matchups. Patriots, Colts, Falcons, Vikings. The Colts blew away the Patriots, and I'm pretty sure Viking fans are experiencing PTSD from reliving this moment again. Many years ago, the Falcons upset the Vikings and went to the Super Bowl to get blown out by the Denver Broncos. This year, they didn't get blown out, but it was surprisingly low scoring considering the Offensive Player of the Year and the rushing title holder were on the same team. The Colts are your Super Bowl champions and that will be it for this video. I won't be doing the Pro Bowl, it's, it, it's really time consuming. But the next video will be similar to this one. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next one.